Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's path to democracy was long and arduous. As historian Bruce Cummings concluded, there may be no country more deserving of democracy in our time than the Republic of Korea. While many initially assumed Korea would transition towards a liberal, democratic system following the end of Japanese colonialism, decades of authoritarianism and dictatorship ensued. Despite being founded as such in 1947, it is only four decades later that South Korea became a democracy in practice, with the election of President no tae in December 1987. While the 1980s was the decade that saw democracy eventually triumph, the role played by pro-democracy movements in the 1970s has all too often been forgotten. Despite General Park chung hees iron fist rule, several social movements and constituencies, students, liberal church groups, unions, lawyers, and journalists, structured and organized themselves during those years, paving the way for the major successes of the following decade. This is the core argument of protest dialectics, state repression, and South Korea's democracy movement, published by Stanford University Press this year and written by Professor Paul Chang, who kindly agreed to be our guest for this episode. Professor Chang is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Harvard University. He received his PhD from Stanford in 2008. He taught at Yonsei and Singapore Management University before joining the Harvard faculty in 2013. He currently serves on the Executive Committee of the Korea Institute at Harvard University and is affiliated with the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Harvard Asia Center's Council on Asian Studies. Professor Chang, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Why did you decide to focus your studies and research on the democratization of Korea? My first uh, entry into the topic was through liberation theology, actually. I was a graduate student at a seminary, Divinity School, and I started studying Latin American liberation theology. Somebody told me about uh, Minjung Shinak, or Minjung Theology in Korea, so I started studying that. And to get better contextual knowledge, I started studying the history around Minjung Theology and the rise of Minjung Theology in the 1970s. Um, I got to learn about Park chung hees Yushin government at the time and the democracy movement at the time. Mm -hmm. And so the more and more deeper I got into the topic, I realized I needed a stronger sociological account of what had happened to contextualize the theology. Mm -hmm. And then I got interested in students and journalists and lawyers and other groups as well. And then it's basically snowballed from there. Could you maybe provide us with a, a brief overview of Korea's democratization process? I think most listeners are aware, of course, of the liberation. Maybe they've heard of Park chung hee and then they know there's a democratization happening. But they usually don't really know the steps or how it actually unfolded. Uh, most people think and assume, if you're outside of South Korea or Korea, that South Korea was always a democratic government. But uh, for the majority of, the, of its short existence, it was actually an authoritarian government. In 1948, the constitution was written such that Korea was supposed to be, South Korea was supposed to be a democratic government, but Syngman Rhee, the first president, elected president, he amended the constitution to rerun, extended his power, and towards the end of the 1950s, when he was about to run for, I believe it was his fourth presidential term, uh, by that time people were pretty fed up. And the trigger was actually the vice presidential election, because at the time, the presidential and vice presidential elections were separate or independent of each other. And when, when people were upset about the corruption of the vice presidential elections, uh, the students, first at Kode, uh, rose up, uh, hmm. which quickly escalated into the April 1960 uh, student revolutions, Haigu, that began on April 19th. The aftermath was that uh, Syngman Rhee abdicates, moves back to Hawaii, uh, and the interim government, or actually it wasn't supposed to be interim, but eventually it was, uh, under Chang Myon and Yun bo -sun. It doesn't last because in 1961 in May, General Park chung hee stages a coup, a relatively quiet coup actually, a bloodless coup. And he rules from 1961 to 1963 under military rule, but he was being pressured by both society and uh, the Americans to re-establish civilian rule. So he retires from uh, the military and runs as a civilian president in 1963. And then he runs again for a second term, or he starts the second term in 1967 for a second and supposedly last term as president. 
But in 1969, he decides that he, he is going to force the National Assembly to amend the Constitution so he can run f for president just one more time. So it wasn't uh, forever. It was just one additional term. Uh, and he pushes that amendment through. Uh, and in 1971, he wins the election to be president for a third term. And he wins over uh, Kim Dae-jung. Surprisingly to him and to most people probably at the time, uh, a very, very close race. Hmm. So in 1971, he begins his, uh, his third term as president, but shortly thereafter, in 1972, he decides that the democratic system is not going to work for him, and he revises the Constitution significantly, uh, such that it's, it was a lot of people consider it to be almost a completely new Constitution, the Yushin Constitution in 1972. And then at that point, you no longer have direct presidential elections. You no longer have limitations on terms of president. And the system is such that the president is now elected through an electoral college, so indirect mm -hmm. elections. Um, that essentially guarantees his lifelong rule. And this is another way of saying that uh, Park chung yee transitions into formal authoritarianism in 1972. But it doesn't end there, though. In 1975 and 1979 was another critical, distinct period after promulgating the emergency decrees. And so that period is called the emergency decree era, which is a highly, highly repressive period. In 1979, Park chung is assassinated, and there is a brief moment of hope for democracy, but Chun Doo-hwan takes political control. Um, in May 1980, there's the Gwangju uprising, which Chun Doo-hwan represses quite severely. Hmm. Just as highly, if not more repressive than even the Yushin period was the period between 1980 and 1984. In 1984, Chun Doo-hwan relaxes some of his policies um, and lets people to congregate and organize and lets uh, oppositional parties to uh, mobilize politically. That trend eventually culminates in the summer protests in June of 1987. And for various reasons, not just because of the protest, but also because of a certain amount of confidence in economic development, pressure from the United States to not repress Korean citizens, and really the attention that Korea was getting because of the 1988 Summer Olympics, Chun Doo-hwan was not able to forcefully shut down the protests in the summer of 1987. Uh, eventually, uh, Chen Duan, through his chosen successor, uh, Noteu, declares that they're going to reinstate direct presidential election. And that's the moment of democratic transition when Korea finally becomes a democracy. So if Korea, uh, the promise of democracy was made in 1948, it was actually 40 years later that Korea actually becomes mm. a democracy. A couple of the key moments of political development after the transition in 1998 uh, you have, when Kim Dae-jung assumes the presidency, you have the first peaceful transfer of power from the ruling power uh, party to the opposition party. Uh, and then, so you have 10 years of progressive rule, first Kim Dae-jung and No mi -yeon. And then in 2007, with the election of Lee myung bak he assumes his presidency in 2008. Mm -hmm. Then you have a transfer back to conservative rule, but still within the confines of democratic procedure. It was very peaceful. I mean, there's a lot of criticism about um, the health of democracy and the authoritarian tendencies of the current president, et cetera. Mm. But uh, these are all pretty good signs that Korea is transitioning from both to progressive and back to conservative. And who knows what's going to happen in the future, but that the system itself is in place. In a, in a few words, would you say that Korea's democratization, the whole narrative behind it, are, are unique to Korea, to the country? Or do they follow patterns that have been seen uh, elsewhere in other democratic transitions? Um, that's a really good question. There's not a there's not a good, clean answer for that. I think some would argue that Korea has in fact followed patterns that we see elsewhere. Um, modernization theory, for example, mm. um, the most simplistic understanding of it is that developing nations with economic development, the more economic development there is, then you get the transition to democracy. So economic development is almost a prerequisite to democratization, and if you look at Korean history, that's essentially what happened. Um, you have economic development first under authoritarian rule, and in the 1980s with the rise or the emergence of a middle class, and really it was the middle class, white collars, workers, participation in protests that really kind of pushed the uh, government to uh, reform or to reinstate direct presidential elections. So if, if that's the understanding 
or that's the interpretation of what had ha- actually happened empirically, then that actually confirms modernization theory. That's one way of looking mm-hmm. at it. It's still important to consider the um, unique aspects uh, of Korean democratization plus politics that may be different from other cases. Um, so one thing, um, Hagen Ku at University of Hawaii has argued that Korea is uniquely a case where you have a very, very strong state and a very contentious civil society. And there's a legacy of that that continues. And I think that's quite important to understand that dynamic of why civil society is, in fact, contentious. And that leads to other uh, manifestations, for example, the lack of trust in government. So um, one of the arguments is that the decades-long authoritarian rule um, led to people not really trusting the government. Hmm. Um, Not all segments of society, obviously, but significant portions of it. Another legacy of Korea's political development that lingers today is quite a clear distinction between conservative and progressive groups, and and not just political groups, but also in society itself. So the divide between left and right and uh, the really polarization of Korean society, I think, is quite a a unique feature of the authoritarian legacy. So on the the one hand, um, I think Korea does, in fact, follow certain common narratives that we find elsewhere, but on the other hand, um, has quite unique uh, attributes. Mm. Your new book, Protest Dialectics, State Repression in South Korea's Democracy Movement, uh, which is the basis for this interview, focuses on the 1970s in South Korea, a period you write many consider as a dark age for democracy in Korea. Why were the democratic prospects so grim during that decade, and why did you decide to focus on on that decade? Uh, I think one of the narratives that I uh, was confronted with when I started studying Korean history formally was how... When we talk about the democracy movement, people always mention, in the, in the post-liberation period, people mention, obviously, uh, the April 1960s student revolution. And then it kind of jumps to Gwangju in 1980, and then democratic transition in 1987. And so I was kind of curious why the 60s and 70s are not really talked about. And when people did talk about the 1970s, the overall dominant narrative was that it was a highly repressive dark time. So that got me thinking about what were the kinds of social movements that were maybe possible in that highly repressive period. And so I got interested in the 1970s for that reason. Uh, And like I said before, one of the interesting aspects of the 1970s is the role of religious groups, especially Mm -hmm. Christians, both Protestant and and Catholic. And I was interested in the sociology of religion. And so um, that led me to study the 1970s. I think the 1970s is critical because... It was the onset of formal, institutionalized authoritarianism. So Sigmund Rhee was, most people considered to be an autocratic leader. And Park Chung-hee in the 1960s, people were considered to be an authoritarian leader as well. But that's kind of a very simplistic understanding of the development of authoritarianism in South Korea. I think... Uh, for example, we take Park Chung-hee as an example. Yes, it was a military coup d'etat in 1961, but he reverts back to a democratic system in 1963. And he was actually elected president direct, through direct presidential elections. Um, and there may have been certain levels of corruption and ballot stuffing and things like that. But the overall system, at least the overall semblance of it, was democracy or mm-hmm. democratic procedures that were in place. In 1972 constitutionally, all of that is gone. And so when we talk about authoritarianism in South Korea, there's the sort of general sense of authoritarianism starting way back from Simon Rhee's period. But in terms of formal authoritarianism, it was really in the 1970s that that begins. And that, does, and that lasts until 1987, right? Um, and also 1970s is considered to be dark because of the emergency decrees that were Uh, highly sensationalized, and if you talk to the older generation, like I have, uh, they still remember that period, the emergency decree era period. So that looms large in the minds and the imaginations of the older generation. Hmm. Um, Another very interesting thing, which I don't delve too much in the book, but is obviously very, very important, is the larger international Cold War context. And so the 1970s is critical because in the, in, towards the late 1960s, early 1970s, you get the uh, cooling, or I should say, that's probably a poor choice of words, but you get 
more friendly relations between China and America with Richard Nixon's visit to Bhutan, right? The Cold War to Bhutan. So that really contributed to the anxiety of of not just Park Chung-hee, but most South Koreans. Uh, And obviously, the threat of communism was a very real one uh, at the time. And the Vietnam War, and especially with the fall of Saigon in 1975, was obviously very, very critical. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the 1970s, and it's a really dynamic period. And this is not even talking about the economic stuff that's going on, uh, which is a which is a huge story in and of itself. But to try to understand how social movements mobilized in this really, quote-unquote, dark, dark era Hmm. for democracy was very, very interesting to me. Because as you write in the 1970s, you see the consolidation of various pro-democracy activist groups. Um, So in the end, the 70s are critical because they paved the way for democratization. Is that that a fair assessment? Um, I think so. That's the argument I make in the book. Um, I think when we talk about 1980s democracy movement, everybody talks about it. And obviously, students have been protesting throughout history. I mean, they were protesting even way before in the colonial period as well, and they're a very critical group. And there are also small groups of intellectuals that were already politicized, but a lot of the groups that were active in the 1980s, for example, labor groups, um, or labor, and Christians, and journalists, and human rights lawyers, if you trace back when these social groups became politicized, it was actually in the 1970s mm-hmm. that they became politicized. And so I, I'm not saying that they were significant in numbers or even significant in impact, but this is the beginnings, the origins of the politicization of distinct and important sectors of Korean society. And then in the 1980s, all of that comes to fruition um, with the large democracy movement. Um, and just a quick word about labor. I am not saying that labor was not mobilizing for democratic unions, for example, in the 1960s and periods earlier, they were. But the connection between labor protests, economic issues, and tying that to the authoritarian government, the dictatorship of Park chung begins really in the 1970s with key labor protest movements, um, YH incident, where the women workers went to the uh, opposition party building to protest as an explicit statement Hmm. that their economic grievances are tied to the political dictatorship that was happening at the time. And again, labor, like other scholars have argued, including Hagen Koo and Nami Lee, uh, labor was not fully politicized. There were many groups that were trying to politicize the labor, the workers, Christians, students, etc. And they don't really come into their own into the uh, the latter half of the 1980s. But you get the beginnings of the politicization of the labor movement, in the, and that was in the 1970s. And so I think that's important to think about as well. We would like to first focus on one group uh, from among those that played an active part uh, in the democratization process: the students, especially those from SNU, since we are talking here on the campus of Seoul National University right now, and also because they were quite arguably a very important group. You write about how, for example, one SNU student, Kim Sang-jin, famously committed a seppuku to denounce political executions uh, by the Yushin state apparatus. Why did students become these, these radical agents of change? I think generally in most societies, students tend to be more progressive. Uh, some of it's a factor of age. Uh, younger people tend to have more progressive views, liberal views, than older generations. Korean students have a history of being politically active going back to the colonial period. And all obviously there was the significant moment in 1960 when the student, when students started the revolution that eventually brought down Sun Min Ri's government. So there was quite a lot of pride there because Saigu, the student revolution in 1960, was actually one of the few, if not the only, case of where an actual movement was at, at least in the short end or the short run uh, successful in achieving their goals of bringing down Sun Min Ri's government. And so there was a lot of pride and there was a lot of, I'm guessing, hope or optimism that they can actually exact social change uh, and they can be a real force or an agent of social change in Korean society. So students were always had that in them. And there are demographic issues too. Why it's not just their politicization, but there are demographic issues too. Simply that the number of student, students enrolled in universities was growing tremendously. And so you have a huge, a much larger population of students in Korean society uh, that begins in the 60s and 70s and grows continues into the 80s as well. So you have a lot more students. That's, a, that's another way of putting it. 
Um, you write in your book that, interestingly, one of the big catalysts of student revolts seems to be, well, a form of nationalism because many could not accept Pak chung normalization treaty with Japan that was signed in 1965. Is it fair to say that many protests were motivated by the defense of the nation first, and, well, it so happened that democracy was maybe the best way to defend the interests of that nation as a second step? Um, yeah, I think so. I think one way of thinking about that question is about not so much defending, I mean, in, I guess in a sense it is defending the nation, but it's really about defining what the Korean nation should be. Protesting groups, including students, didn't want or didn't accept Park chung quote-unquote Korean-style democracy, which was really a euphemism for authoritarianism. Uh, and they wanted real political participation, and they wanted generally greater equality of classes. And so, in a sense, they were defending their vision of the nation. And I think students felt that it was their responsibility mm -hmm. to protect the nation-state um, and their vision of what the nation-state should be. And in, in this sense, it was obviously a democratic nation-state. What did the, uh, the student movements achieve in terms of democratization at the time? Um, how were they structured, and would you say that these structures uh, remain today, or how, how have they evolved? Uh, that's an interesting question, because if you look at the 1970s specifically, the student movement, they are heavily repressed at two time points, one in the fall of 1971, and then in April of 1974, during the Mincheong incident, which is uh, the systematic repression of the student movement by Park chung government. And in that sense, and after the, during the emergency decree era, students try to regain some momentum, but really they don't. And so one way of looking at it is the students actually don't achieve much in the uh, Yushin period anyway. But the same thing can be said for the 1980s. Uh, in 1980, it started with the students, but then, you know, obviously it spread to the citizens of the city of Gwangju. But that event or the Gwangju uprising was heavily, heavily repressed, as we all know. And so in that sense, we can't really talk about students achieving mm -hmm. or even protesting groups achieving anything, but actually really it's about the failure and it's the story is about state repression. But students remobilized in the summer of 1987 and obviously they become a really important group in pressuring the government to uh, reinstate direct presidential elections. I think what students brought to the table more than any other group was their large very public displays of anti-government sentiment. And more than any other group, they were able to mobilize the numbers. Hmm. The students tended to uh, mobilize quite disruptive tactics or use disruptive tactics like the temu uh, compared to other protesting groups. And in that okay, sense- What is the temu, sorry? The demonstration. Oh, I see. The temu in Korean, that's what they, hmm. the, the shorthand is temu in Korean. And I think in that sense, When we think about the democracy movement of the 70s, 80s, we immediately, or most of us immediately, have a vision of tear gas, riot police, and students throwing uh, homemade bombs. That image is what the students brought. And there were many, many different kinds of protests, and that was actually was not the only kind, but uh, that's what we remember. And so in that sense, I would say students played an important role in organizing the largest and the most public displays of anti-government sentiment. So that was very important, mm. obviously. We're talking here about the students, but were they actually a united group or were they different currents within the protesting uh, students? And was the majority of students politically active actually at the time? Or are we talking about a minority that just happened to be obviously extremely influential? Yeah, that's a, that's a very hard empirical question to answer actually, um, partly because it's hard to get the numbers um, of how many students were protesting. I tried. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the second part first. My guess is that while the absolute numbers of students who were actually actively engaged in the democracy movement were quite significant, maybe as a proportion of the student population, they might not have been the majority. Uh, for example, in the systematic repression of the student movement in fall of 1971, roughly 1,000 students are arrested My guess is 1,000 students. I mean, I'm sure there are other, a lot more students who were not arrested that did participate, but 1,000 students is not a large proportion of the student body, especially if you think nationwide. And, mm. and, and, and again, in 1974, during the Mincheong which uh, in the lore of you know, democratization narratives um, looms large, uh, it was about 1,000 students there too. And so if you think in that sense, as a proportion to the student po or university student enrollment across the nation, maybe it's not as large. 
maybe maybe the right way of thinking about it is not so much their numbers totally but in total but really about students as a group as a symbolic group were known in society as the group that was leading the charge against Park Chung-hee's government so I think they're very important in that sense and also whether or not the students were united I think that's a really interesting question because much of the student mobilization uh, the tactic was to create a national front against Park Chung-hee's government. That is to say that much of the tactic was to unite the students from all the different schools. And so um, there might have been a lot of student protests within your campus organized by certain study groups and cell groups and things like that. The connections between the schools or coordinated protests between the schools within Seoul, but also between the urban areas and the rural areas, that was a huge, huge uh, goal of the student movement. So um, if you think about it backwards, in a sense that maybe there was less unity in terms of mobilizing. Um, I would say there's probably more unity in terms of ideology and goals, but in terms of actual mobilization, um, one of the main goals is to create a, na create a national front in the 1970s. Hmm. One of the main targets of the student movement at the time was mandatory military service. What was the, the rationale behind it? What, what kind of symbolism did they see uh, behind the military that they wanted to go against? I think um, in 1971, uh, the, the numbers of, pro of student protests spikes dramatically. And it was primarily driven by three uh, motivating factors. One was the death of garment worker Chon Taeyeol, who died on November 13, 1970. And uh, the students really start to mobilize around the issue of labor at the time. The first time they actually got interested in labor was around that time. Uh, another issue was the 1971 presidential election. But the third issue was when the government changed the mandatory military training exercise hours, so the hours you have to do to fulfill your uh, military training, they increased those hours, the government increased those hours as a way to try to discipline the student population. So that was really, really upsetting to the students and that actually galvanized a lot of protest. Clearly, clearly the government used uh, military, mandatory military service and also military training exercises within the schools when you're on campus as a way to discipline uh, the student population. But also, the government might have also been motivated to buttress their army. I mean, they, hmm. national security was a real threat. So these are not mutually exclusive motivations. You have mandatory military service because you need a standing army uh, because of the, the North Korean threat, obviously, but also it... It's great that for the government that you can also use that to discipline the student population. So my, my guess is that they're not mutually exclusive motivations by the government. You already discussed uh, 1971. That year, four Seoul National University student leaders were arrested and uh, tortured. The year after that, we see the passing of the Yushin Constitution. And in response, the student movement regrouped and vowed to achieve nothing less than the removal of Pak chung from power. So is it fair to say that that year, uh, those protests were, were really the turning point? I think there were two turning points. Yes, 1971 was a critical turning point because not so much for the student movement, but for the government strategy of dealing with the student movement. And after a huge, like I said, a huge spike in the number of protests in 1971, in the fall of 1971, the government institutes a systematic repression strategy to try to root out the student movement and to quell the movement for once and for all. And so in the fall of 1971, like I said, roughly a thousand student leaders and student protests are arrested and are in jail, a lot of them are in jail, etc. And so that leads to a very, very quiet year in the beginning of 1972, which, as we all know, at the end culminates in October of 1972 with the Yishin Constitution. Politically speaking, though, 1972 was a turning point. And the reason why uh, the student movement changed or evolved from criticizing specific policies like anti-normalization with Japan or Korea's participation in the Vietnam War to really criticize the foundational structures of the government and to really um, work towards getting Park chung out of power was because the system itself had changed. So mm. to me, 1972 was a critical juncture in terms of the political infrastructure, the foundations of the political system in South Korea, and 1971 was a 
important moment in the systematic repression of the students, which we see again in 1974 and 1975. You write that demonstrations were often constrained by uh, repression, uh, but you also mentioned at the beginning of your book that some authors refute any linear relationship between repression and, and protest. So what are their arguments and um, do you think they are wrong? I don't, I mean, it's hard to say that they're wrong for all cases throughout all time. That uh, I don't think that's really the point. I think it's important to appreciate that certain patterns, so the impact of repression on mobilization depends on unique contextual factors, obviously. And so sometimes repression is a useful tactic. Other times repression fuels, backfires, and fuels additional mm -hmm. protests. And, and sometimes the relationship is nonlinear to say that in the beginning it might be effective, but then later on it's not, or vice versa. So I think it's really important to appreciate uh, the nuanced relationship between repression and protest. Another thing that's important is to think about not a simplistic understanding of repression affecting the number, the aggregate numbers of the protests. So, for example, repression leads to uh, lower numbers of protests, and so therefore it's effective, or actually repression backfires, and now there's more protests, so it's ineffective. I think the argument is to get around or, or to get away from this understanding of thinking about social movements simply as an aggregate count of the total number of protests, and to think about more qualitatively, even though there are moments when it seems like the movement is dying out because there's less public acts of protest. What's happening underground? And I think uh, that's what I try to show in my research, that during the emergency decree era, when the total numbers of protests are dwindling because of the highly repressive context, there are significant, significant developments that have long-lasting consequences. I'll just mention one here. But it was during this time that the issue of human rights becomes increasingly salient in the democracy movement. And when we sort of think about, and this is a very interesting thing to think about, was now if you look at the social movements that are happening in 2015, everybody uses the master frame of human rights. It might be the disabilities movement, it might be the unwed mothers movement, mm -hmm. um, it might be the gay and lesbian rights movement, but they use that frame. And so when did human rights become part of the discourse, the master Master frame in civil society, if you, tra if you track it back, it was really in the 1970s where it really starts to become an important part of civil society. And it happens as repression is on the rise, and that leads to total numbers of protests declining, and yet the development of the ideology of human rights continues to grow. So I think that's what I was trying to say, or what, what I want to argue, is to think about a more complex understanding of the, of the impact of state repression on mobilization. Let's talk now about uh, Christian uh, movements, uh, and I would like to uh, pick a quote from your book uh, from Pak hyung -gyu, a former pastor of the Seoul First Church. I saw students shot and killed by guns. From then on, I made up my mind to become a pastor of the true church. So you write that Christian churches generally, in, and progressive Christians in particular, increasingly participated in these anti-government protests. How do we explain the politicization of the church and also, which churches are we talking about? So I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting question to think about uh, the history of the Korean church's role in Korean politics. And the history goes a lot further back than the post-liberation period. And really, there was a legacy of the church participation in politics in the colonial period, starting with the March 1st, 1919 movement. It's quite remarkable that Protestant Christianity was introduced to Korea in the late 1800s, and yet by 1919 already the leaders of the church are the ones, uh, or the church uh, leaders are the ones that are organizing, uh, many of them are organizing the independence movement against Japan in 1919. And then in the 1930s when Japan institutes the assimilation policies, one of which was to um, make it mandatory for Koreans to pay their tribute or worship at the Shinto shrines. It was a lot of churches that went against it. I mean, mostly for theological reasons, not for political reasons, but it was interpreted as a political challenge to the colonial government. And so at that time, a lot of the missionaries, the American missionaries and foreign missionaries are kicked out. Some of the churches are closed. Some of the seminaries are closed. And so they have this legacy of uh, participating in mm -hmm. politics, either directly or indirectly. In the 1950s and 60s, because of the suffering and the tragedy of the Korean War, I mean, obviously not just Christian groups, but many, many groups, both religious and secular, 
engaged in humanitarian efforts, and the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church were both involved in that. And there was this consistent social concerns for the poor and for the suffering, the orphanages, um, etc. That social concern evolves and becomes more politicized in the 1970s because of the change in the political system from the democratic, even though it was a compromised democratic system, it was still a semblance of it, uh, to the formal authoritarian system after 1972. And so at that point, a small segment, a very, I mean, and I don't want to overrepresent them, but you know, it was a small, in terms of absolute numbers, a small group of progressive Christians that became very, very active in the democracy movement, um, and not only active, but also became leaders, prominent mm. leaders in the democracy movement. So this was a group that if we sort of break down the spectrum of Korean Christianity was on the far left. They were progressive. I'll talk about the Catholics in a second, but for the Protestants, they primarily came from a progressive Protestant uh, Presbyterian denomination called Kijang. Their flagship seminary was Hanguk Shinakte, or Korean Theological Seminary. And the president of Korean Theological Seminary was a pastor named Kim Jae-jun. And Kim Jae-jun is considered to be the father of liberal theology, that is to say a theology that's concerned about the poor and the social gospel. And his faculty, many, uh, several members of his faculty at, at Korean Theological Seminary go on to become the leaders of the democracy movement and the first architects, the first generation Minjung theologians. For example, Muni Kwan, Mun Dong Wan, um, uh, An Byung Moo, all taught at Korean Theological Seminary. It's important to remember, however, that the great majority of the church leadership, Christian leadership in Korea were theologically conservative. And even some, some of those conservative church leaders actively supported Park chung government, even during the Asian period. And I would, say the, I would say the majority of Christians were not the ones that participated in the democracy movement, but a small group did, and their uh, participation was quite, quite significant. That's the Protestants. A quick word about the Catholics. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of key Catholic leaders who really sort of came to the fore of the democracy movement. One was uh, Bishop Chiak Sun, who was the bishop of the Wanju, Wanju area. And he, because of his convictions, participated in the democracy movement, went to jail. He wrote a famous Declaration of Conscience, which really galvanized the Catholic Church. And he had the support of his cardinal, Cardinal Kim Soan at the time. This is all contextualized in the larger international liberation theology movement that began in Latin America, but was really kind of supported by the Vatican at the Second uh, Vatican Council and so of 1965. So I think those larger international trends influenced the Korean church, both the Catholic and the Protestant wings. Can we say that this church involvement is related to the fact that most new converts were factory workers who naturally had an interest in improving their working conditions and also had traditionally just no voice in uh, the Korean political system? Yes, I think so. On the one hand, I think, yes, that's um, true, that because the urban church and the churches in Seoul were populated by this new there was an incredible urbanization process that happened in the 60s and 70s where people came up from the countryside to work in the factories in the cities and a lot of them looked towards the church for, uh, for help. Um, and a lot of the social welfare programs uh, were run through the churches for that very reason. But I'm not sure that's a sufficient enough factor because they also joined the conservative churches and probably, actually, if you think about pure numbers, there were probably more factory workers in the conservative churches and yet the conservative churches didn't feel that to ameliorate the problems of their laity, their worker, uh, ladies, the lady that worked in the factories, hmm. that they had to challenge Park Chung-hee's government, right? And so they might provide some services, but it wasn't a politicized anti-government movement like you had in the progressive church. Hmm. And so if, if you have equally... And it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be equal, but if you have factory workers in both the progressive and conservative churches or the entire spectrum of churches and only the progressives are protesting, then there must have been some other factor that probably explains mm. why they're protesting. You're right, Christians were responsible, or Christian groups were responsible for some of the most significant anti-government events uh, of the 1970s. What were the main events and what did the church or churches achieve? So I think um, the church participation uh, for the... 
Protestant Christians begins in um, 1973 with Pastor Park kyung Easter Sunday protest. And when he is arrested for being a communist, and actually he's arrested, or the government accuses him of trying to overthrow the government so that he can be the president, which almost everybody saw as a ridiculous possibility. And that really galvanizes the progressive Christian wing. Uh, so that was one of the main events, and that leads to a theological declaration by cr- Christian pastors to state why they are taking a stand against Park chung government. And that statement, the 1973 Theological Declaration, actually is the seminal statement that eventually culminates in a theological understanding of political participation, which we now know as Minjung Theology. In terms of actual protest events on the, on the Protestant side, after the emergency decrees of 1974 and 1975, and in 1976, 1976 was a very, very quiet year because a lot of the students were arrested and in jail, and the emergency decrees um, preemptively stopped a lot of people from participating. Mm-hmm. And in March 1st, 1976, a group of Christian leaders, but also politicians, including Kim Dae-jung and other people, uh, they make a declaration against the government. And that declaration reignites the democracy movement when it was very, very, very dark and very, very quiet. And it's still today considered to be one of the hallmark events of the 1970s. Um, on the Catholic side, uh, the arrest of Bishop Chiak Sun, um, the government accused him of supporting the students during the Mincheong incident, and he was arrested uh, with other people, uh, including Kim ji and Kim Dae-jung and others. Um, and in prison, when he writes his Declaration of Conscience, that really galvanizes the Catholic, a lot of the Catholics as well. Hmm. You wrote about the uh, Christian advantage and that Christian protests were, quote-unquote, a bane for Pak chung Why were they particularly effective and how did they dodge state repression more effectively than other groups such as the students, as you mentioned in your book? I think Christians had very unique advantages that helped them relatively fare better than other secular groups. One was their moral standing in society. One of the standard strategies by which Pak Chengi would frame dissidents was to accuse them of being communists. And, uh, you know, everybody knew that. It was a little bit, relatively, I should say. It was relatively uh, more difficult to accuse Christians of being communists because of the unique church history. It's easy to forget that before, during the colonial period, before the division of the nation states, um, there was a significant portion of Christians living in the north. And in fact, Pyongyang Theological Seminary was one of the key seminaries in the colonial period that trained mm-hmm. the first generation of uh, Korean pastors. And, the Rome of Asia, even, right, for some writers. Exactly. You know? And when, when uh, Kim Il-sung uh, takes control and he persecutes both landowners and Christians and they all come down, uh, the refugee church, one of the prime examples, the Yeongnak church, was populated by North Korean refugees, essentially. And so Christians, obviously there were many, many groups that were anti-communist, but Christians sort of had that moral standing that they were highly anti I mean, as a whole, as a, mm. as a, very, as a whole. And so even for the progressive Christians, it was, it was a little bit, it was relatively more difficult to accuse Christians, whether progressive or not, of being communists that you can do with secular students. So they had that going for them. Um, the second thing is they had an already established organizational network through their churches. And so when students, one of the, like I said, one of, the, one of the main tactics that students were trying to develop was to create networks across the nation between student circles. Christians sort of already had that through their denominational ties across different church groups. So they were able to rely on that uh, organizational network and that helped them to mobilize. A third factor and, and possibly the most important factor is their connections to the international church groups and international humanitarian groups. And I'll just give you one example. Um, Lee Woo Jung was the president. She was the she was a professor at Seoul Women's University and she was fired for protesting the government. And she, even though she was fired, she kept protesting and she actually became uh, she was the person who read the March 1st, 1976 declaration at Myeongdong Cathedral. Um, and it was signed by such prominent people like past President Yoon Bo-san, Kim Dae-jung, Muni Kwan, etc. And Lee Woo-jung was quickly, along with many of the uh, organizers of that protest, uh, she was arrested again. 
But a flood of letters started coming in from Church Women United. She was the director of Church Women United in Korea. And so the Church Women United group in America uh, mobilized to write a bunch of letters to Park Chung-hee to demand that she be released. And Park Chung-hee was quite conscious uh, and sensitive to foreign criticism. And it's, it's, it's hard to tell exactly why, but she was released much faster than everybody else. Um, and she, when I interviewed her before she passed away, uh, she told me that she attributes her early release to those letters and the support that she received from Church Women United. But organizationally speaking, the National Council of Churches of Korea is the Korean wing of the World Council of Churches. Hmm. The Korean Student Christian Federation is the Korean branch of the World Student Christian Federation. And so these Christian groups had direct organizational ties to international groups that pressured Park jung and supported the movement in both, mater- both materially by donating money, but also symbolically and culturally as well. To wrap up our conversation on the various social groups, can you give us a quick idea of the role of journalists, lawyers, or any other significant groups there in the picture? Um, In the 1970s, there were a couple of key developments, I would say. Um, I think it was the birth of the free speech movement, starting with the Tongwa-Ilbo Journalist uh, Declaration of, of a Free Press in 1974. And if, and it's quite remarkable to think that the free press movement that is so important today has its origins in that time. Another key group is uh, human rights lawyers, Inkwan Pyonosa. And that term, Inkwan Pyonosa, was a term that was first uh, started to gain traction amongst progressive communities in the 1970s, primarily because there weren't a lot of lawyers that were willing to take on cases of anti-government protesters. And when the, when the students were being arrested in the hundreds and in the thousands, uh, they needed lawyers. And a very few number of lawyers had to defend them or th- were willing to defend them. And just because if you're willing to defend them, you're automatically labeled a inkwon penalty mm-hmm. or a human rights lawyer. And this term catches on, and now you get, for example, second-generation human rights lawyers like President No Myon in the 1980s. Uh, they formalized the, their movement into uh, human rights law groups like Min Myon, for example, who are critical in c- contemporary civil society today. And so uh, human rights law is huge in Korean civil society today. And if you track that back and the or- think about the origins of that, it was really in the 1970s that you get the emergence of the first generation of human rights lawyers. And so along with students and intellectuals that were consistently politicized, new groups, not only Christians, but also lawyers and journalists and other groups really emerged to become important players in the democracy movement in the 1970s. In the face of government repression, we see a development of various tactics aimed at circumventing government crackdowns uh, and violence. Tactics also become more complex as the variety of actors increases. Students, workers, the media, the Christian groups. Can you maybe tell us about that and whether some groups were, so to speak, specialized in some kind of actions and how did they coordinate or not coordinate? I think it's important to, uh, again, think about moving beyond simply counting the number of protests as the main indicator of the vitality of a, of a social movement. And if we get beyond aggregate counts, we can think about things such as the diversification of actors. And so uh, it's not how many protests, but who's really protesting and at what times. Um, are they protesting and when do certain groups come to the fore and when do certain groups subside and so the argument was that even as the number of protests dwindled over time that you get a diversification of new groups that are emerging to lead the movement Uh, one of the secondary consequences of that diversification is that each group tended to protest in their own ways students demonstrated primarily And because demonstrations is quite an unruly, disruptive tactical form, Christians didn't really do that. Christians popularized prayer protests, using the religious services as a stage for anti-government demonstration or or, uh, protest event. Journalists, they were professionals. They tended to make declarations. That was their mainstay protest (laughs) tactic, along with intellectuals and politicians as well. And so, uh, obviously, workers are striking because they're most, mostly concerned about local uh, um, labor issues. And so, what we get is the repression decreasing the total number of protests, and yet we get more and more different kinds of groups protesting. And as more groups protest, they bring with them a diversity of tactics. And so, mm-hmm. um, I talk about this concept of actor-tactic symmetry, where 
you get each group protesting in unique ways and as more groups join you get a diversification of taxes which changes the overall character of the democracy movement in the 1970s what about actor issue symmetry did specific groups specialize in protests against particular issues and not just about democracy as such so similarly each social group that was protesting although the larger goal was to reinstate the presidential elections and, and to uh, recover democracy, they had unique issues that they brought to the table. For example, journalists were obviously concerned about censorship and uh, a free press and free speech. Uh, Christians, they mentioned the freedom of religion. Uh, workers mentioned labor rights. Uh, human rights law talked about the rule of law, and human rights lawyers were able to criticize the constitutionality of the Asian constitution, and obviously the lawyers are able to do that better than um, other groups. And so, again, repression leads to lower numbers of protests, and yet you get a diversification of actors joining in protest, and they bring with them unique issues that they're concerned about, and this really riches enriches the ideology and the, and the discourse and the narratives that are around democracy. And so if the movement originally began as simply democratic, the recovery of a democratic system, what the meaning of what democracy means becomes more diversified and richer as more and more groups join the democracy movement. Has this spirit of mobilization and democracy survived, would you say, until today? Many argue that the historical actors of democratization in Korea have very much weakened uh, Korean students and I think Seoul National University included, are hardly politicized these days. Korean churches are not exactly known for any kind of progressive agenda anymore. So who, who are the current heirs or representatives of the movements of the past? That's a really tough question. Um, it's a really good question. I guess there are different, different sentiments about it. The cynical sentiment is that people are now apathetic. And that very well might be true. I, you know, the, the students, especially if you look at the students, when they do have a protest uh, in the past, the biggest student protests have been around issues that are unique to their own concerns. For example, the t tuition reduction, hmm. right? I mean, this might be somewhat romanticizing the democracy movement of the past, but in the past, if students were fighting for a larger goal, not their own interests, but the larger goal of the interests of the nation state, students have less of that. I guess that's one of the critiques that uh, people make about the students these days. Um, however, another way of thinking about it is, is there a need for a democracy movement after Korea transitions to a democracy? And so if one way of looking at it is, hey, the democracy movement has died, and there's a certain amount of regret about that after democratic transition, maybe it's a natural thing that you no longer have a democratic, a democracy movement in the context of a functioning democracy. Hmm. Um, not to say, this is obviously not to say that uh, there aren't a lot of problems with Korean democracy and, and certain civil groups play a very, very vital role, a watchdog role in making sure there's less corruption, but it's a hard question. Uh, I don't really have a good answer, hmm. but... I think there are nuanced ways of thinking about this. I don't know if we are allowed to uh, tell this to our listeners, but you have a sticker of solidarity for the victims of the Sewol on your computer. Uh, would you include the Sewol movement in that category as well? Uh, more, let's say. I think so. I yeah. think originally um, it's it's the evolution of the Sewol grievances. So mm -hmm. if the original grievances were about the government didn't do enough to save the students on that ferry and the other people on that ferry, quickly those grievances evolved into a critique of the structures of government and the structures of corruption that are built into how the government runs. And in that sense, it's about democratic consolidation. At that point, it's a critique about the democratic foundations of the political system in Korea. And so in that sense, I would say it could very well be within the legacy of the democracy movement. To conclude, Professor Chang, um, after studying Korea's democratization process so extensively, are you confident in its resilience? And what do you say to those who are concerned about Pak chung nostalgia and to critics who worry, as you mentioned, of these increasing autocratic tendencies within Korean politics? I would say that I would be very, very, very surprised if Korea reverted back to something like the Asian system in the 1970s. I just don't see that happening. Um, I don't think the government can get away with that anymore, even if they wanted to do that. Um, even if they had the military power to do that, um, I think that Korea is at a point where the, demo the democratic system might not be ideal and there might be a lot of problems with it. 
but fundamentally the system is in place and I feel like the system is here to last and I know there's a lot of criticism about the current president and her autocratic tendencies but compared to the Yushin system it, it's, it's hard to say that um, those things are can be equivalent uh, about Park Jung-hee nostalgia, that's a that's a harder one because the nostalgia is obviously not doesn't revolve around Park Jung-hee's political identity. Uh, it revolves more about his ability to lead the economic development, and so it may. And that's not to say that his economic achievements or the achievements that happened during his time as president justifies um, his authoritarian uh, government. But the nostalgia, I feel like, is more economic than it mm. is political. Professor Chang, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.